cultural prostitution. And then the huge wave of kitsch. Somehow these colonial traditions had festered within the military where they still have their home. You have these television programs in Indonesia where the, the choirs, the corps of singers of the ladies in their smart twin sets from the, the army corps groups come out singing from behind rows of tanks. They're incredibly kitsch. And this is in, um, oh, you can see those pots and actually the cycads that we're using at the garden, at the entrance to the garden, which this is in Vietnam. This is in Saigon. It's funny, one of the volunteers came up to him in the summer and says, hey, you must be mad, eh? And I went to the NAM, you know, man, we bombed the shit out of my son. And I said, well, you've got to go back. He said, oh, I couldn't go back. He said, <laughs> it's unbelievably changed. And they're so nice to, because Australia was complicit in that travesty. And they don't hold anyone responsible. They've moved on. They're a wonderful example to the rest of the world about moving on. And they have some very beautiful hotels and gardens. And there was a particularly strong... Um, tradition in Hue of the emperors retiring at age 50 and spending the next 25 years building gardens, building their tomb. There are two amazing ones just outside Hue, which is north of Da Nang. Now, the rustic charm movement, I brought you through to the 60s there, but we'll turn here to the 30s when a lot of artists took up residence in Bali and they wanted to be more Balinese than the Balinese. <laughs> and the idea of the, the tropical idyll I call it the rustic charm movement. This was uh, Le Mayo's house in San Or. This was John Darling, an Australian poet filmmaker who did a very Balinese garden and the idea of the, uh, of the shrine on the lake, which is very important to the Balinese and to Hinduism, always the water and the yellow bamboo. This was Walter Folly, a publisher who married a, a great Balinese beauty and he did this um, sort of rustic charm entrance to his house. Even in Singapore, this is the lifeguards did this at the, uh, one of the famous municipal baths. And it was that little idea of the little pagoda and the, 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 the sort of, you know, ficus. And it's charming, absolutely charming romantic garden. I mean, uh, earlier on, someone used the word about passion, which is terribly important in, in, in decoration. But in artful, natural gardens, it must be poetic. And the sort of poetic element is there should be a story. And the story is often the, the idea of the monastery on the lake, on the water, even in miniature. We have to be careful to preserve that in our passion for, for artful natural gardens, which I, which I feel here very much in Naples. This was the Von Buren garden. So everyone was sort of living native. We'd all gone native. And then I arrived, um, this, this was a mock-up I did for the Four Seasons. And the Four Seasons was 150 villas on the hill behind. You really can't see it at all. Today, the, the, the desired Bali hotel is like a series of microwave ovens <laughs> with a concrete you know, platform. But in the 80s, we were still sort of building things into nature, that the idea of the perfect garden is the combination between the natural and the man-made. And I sort of stormed the beaches in this uh, recreation with those Asmat uh, shields as from the my, my Michael Rockefeller collection the big sahib. And this was my house in Sanor. I lived here for eight years and I, I did this sort of museum of mud adobe architecture, the cross on the wall to keep away the, the demon spirits. And it's actually quite nice to see the lotus there. Hopefully we can get our lotus looking like that in, uh, in Naples. And that was the first hotel I had designed, which was a, a, a mix between a palace, which is always dry, and then a water palace, which is a temple, the Hotel Saba. And that was the first ruinscape I did. Um, it was the idea of the Majupite Garden. Majupite was the last of the great East Javanese, of the great Javanese Hindu empires. And it was the red brick, as happened in Alexandria and other great empires. They always did things out of the red brick. And I, re I just created in the Hyatt in Surabaya this um, little ruinscape and then did another one. That was the first of the pots with the what falling over. I mean, it's an obvious thing to do, but that was a batik vat for dipping an indigo pot. So when you do batik, you have to dip the wax in the indigo and they have these big pots. And uh, that was very popular and has been much copied around the world, almost as much as the lamp from the Bali Hyatt. At that time, the, the Oberoi's were doing gardens, and I had the pleasure of working with Peter Muller, one of the great architects. And I was, through my travels for architecture research, and as a journalist, I used to 
visit a lot of courtyard gardens, and this was my sort of idea of an interesting courtyard garden. And the Naples garden I've done is a little bit like this in field, that sort of poetic look. But ethnic was chic for a long while. There was a book out called uh, Indonesian Ethnic. That was my house. Oops, sorry. So that was the chompang I have in front of my office in my house in Bali, and that's it sort of 10 years later. And even in very tight spaces, you can still create a sort of romantic, poetic garden. And uh, the, the, so it's got to be a, a combination of the interior design and the architecture and the, and the landscape to really work. Now, <laughs> then the poo hit the fan. And because the Indonesians <laughs> had been watching all of us, sahibs, playing at being native, and they didn't want that at all. You know, I came from nature, I don't go back to nature. So they started, that was the, the, the Museum of Archaeology in Bali, which is a terrific sort of thing. But they became very grotesque. I call it going for Baroque. <laughs> the blue chip in a tropical tourism world. And the idea, Tommy Sohato's idea, to build a statue higher than the Statue of Liberty. I mean, it was Balinese culture so bereft that it had to start <laughs> gimmicks. There are more temples and houses in Bali. There's more, you know, you're knee, neck deep in culture. Why would you have to start doing theme parks like that? The blue chip, this was it an old quarry. I mean, what plant grows on top of a limestone column like that? It's sort of like <laughs> plastic ivy at a dentist's. <laughs> but this is, this remains to the day the polite taste. This is Malaysia. I was asked to be a judge at the garden show and there were like 50 gardens like this. Now, for the first hour you're just horrified, you want to run a mile, and then you realise that they've all been done with love. They're all beautifully maintained. But they're masterpieces of kitsch. <laughs> this was the Oberoi. Um, Oberoi's a famous chain. Stop Vicky Oberoi. Revenge of the Barley Lamps. That was a Bill Bensley garden in Mauritius. <laughs> but it's a bit, you know, this viral expression. Well, it started with the Barley Garden, really, that it really went viral around the equator. And Bensley was the, the biggest proponent of the, the sort of knockoff look. Too much is not enough. Less is more, and here's a sort of too much is not enough. But th this is that over, that's, this, this has been now associated with the, the Bali style, unfortunately. You saw a lot of images earlier of the real Bali style, but people now think that this, um, you know, you add a few temple umbrellas and you have all the pots and pans, and <laughs> it's a shocker. Also, you know, the, the Imelda Marcos look was terribly and remains fashion. That's a dictator look. <laughs> and this is the lovely little cute Vietnamese thing with the... Uh, the bonsai, what are they called? Topiary, the topiary deers and things. So you're, be, you're between the kitchen and the killers, really, in the garden. So it was not surprisingly that people turned to minimalism. And I worked for many years with the top architect. I did about 20 of his houses, and then suddenly he realised that nature was old-fashioned and he didn't need a landscaper. That's what they all say, now. we don't really need a landscaper. And this was his attempt, this pink granite pencil sharpener, <laughs> with a, a lilac dwarf bougainvillea, you know, nature's sort of the most depressing plant. <laughs> and all of these houses which were just loveless, treeless, birdless, clueless, godless environments. And they were certainly not children, for me, they were death traps. And they always had those stepping stones. This was this, the head of the Singapore Institute of Architects. This is one of the reasons I'm not asked to do <laughs> gardens on the bay, by the way. <laughs> and I designed this, the New Asia Zen Garden Kit. Because the Singapore Tourism Department invented this idea of New Asia. Because they were so terrified of old Asia. They were all very busy redesigning themselves as of Swiss people and things. And so you have the scatter border and then you have to step. And you'll recognize it. You go to any hotel in the... In